Well, I actually, I actually started on the Boise National Forest in in Idaho. Uh, my first lookout was tripod lookout, and I just happened happened to be in the right place at the right time, I guess. And they hadn't planned on staffing it that that year, and I had um, I had worked on the Emmett Ranger District in recreation for three years prior, but wasn't coming back because I taught school for a year and that kind of overlapped. But then I was passing through and stopped in to say hello and then they happened to have a thunderstorm that started right about the time that I walked in and fires popping up everywhere and in the course of the conversation, they decided to send me a tripod lookout. So that's how I got started. Okay. And, and that was in um, Idaho, right? That was in Idaho, and that's about an um, 8,000 and something foot peak, and it was only accessible either a five mile hike or by helicopter. Wow. So that was interesting. <laughs> yeah. What, um, when they first started talking to you about it, was it something that you jumped at or something that you kind of had? Oh, yeah. Do? Oh, yeah, I did. I just um, kind of always was interested in that. I mean, I had visited, I had visited up there like once or twice before, but um, when the offer was put before me, I, yeah, I jumped at the chance. <laughs> what got, what got so, you interested in it? What got me interested in? In d doing fire lookout. Oh, doing fire lookout? Mm -hmm. Well, just, I don't know, just because it was a chance to do it. And I was, I mean, I was just going through and I needed another job, so um, why not? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and plus it's um, just a beautiful, all the lookouts usually have a lot of beautiful viewing area. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was pretty interesting and uh, we got, my dog and I got taken up in the helicopter with all of our stuff and they kind of, dumped us off up there and said now we're we're gonna hover over the spring <laughs> and they did that. i mean i didn't even hadn't even been on the trail down for like well i had walked up there with another group a couple years prior but i didn't know the way up or back down <laughs> yeah. so it was kind of kind of guesswork and i found the spring which i i had to clean out and do several water tests before it was safe to use, but mm -hmm. I was um, just kind of alone. <laughs> yeah. On this particular one, uh, Rustler Peak, uh, mm -hmm. I think it is, um, how long have you been coming up here? I started this one in 1992. I brought my daughter with me when she was five weeks old. So and they did a um, day trip article in the Mail Tribune after that. And, I got 81 visitors in one day, <laughs> which was kind of kind of excessive. They said they all came to see the baby. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Well, it um, hasn't changed a whole lot. This, this tower was built in 1948, and the lookout site um, well, actually started in... in 1911 after the big fires of 1910 they kind of wanted to put a lookout up here and and i guess it was um being planned and staffed occasionally in 1911 and then 1912 was the first year that it was a full-time staffed lookout the first lookout was ray parker parker meadows campground down there which is to our southeast was named after him because he shot a bear in the meadow. And he was 17 years old when he came up. So he started with just um, climbing up in a tree. <laughs> and then after that, they, they built a cupola style lookout, which I think there's um, only two left in Oregon, in the state of Oregon, and both of them are on this forest. One of them's Hirschberger and the other one's Dutchman Peak. Okay. So, and then that was for a while, but they, they had it on 10-foot uh, steel legs, which was pretty unusual. And then they built this tower in 1948, 
And um, it's had some minor modifications. It used to have the mini pane style to the windows. They replaced those, which is much nicer <laughs> for washing windows and being able to see out of the, the windows. So, but that's one reason why it wasn't eligible for the National Register of Historic Places, not to be confused with the National Historic Lookout Register, which it is on. So, I've been coming up here since 1992, and uh, it's had had some maintenance over the years. I had some major um, work done in 2000, and then just this year they rebuilt the catwalk deck, which is really nice. And they're still planning to do some work on the stairs, but overall it's been um, pretty well maintained. So not not a lot of changes. Um, I just used the Osborne Firebinder, the old model that was um, eventually settled with a 1934 model. And that was invented by William Osborne in 1911, went through a few changes until they kind of settled on the 1934 model, which is the usual one. And I don't I don't do any of the of the modern stuff. Some some lookouts have um, software where you've got to be hooked up to the computer and satellites and all that kind of thing. But I just do the old-fashioned stuff with a fire finder and learning my landmarks. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can, after you've been up here for a few years, you can get pretty good at that. It's even better when they have other lookout staff and you can do a triangulation at crosses. So, uh, kind of miss having more lookout staffed. We used to used to have a couple more lookouts that we we staffed regularly, and they're just um, occasionally now, not full time. And then the state, as you know, went to cameras a few years ago, and that's kind of kind of too bad for me because they were they were very helpful. We could plot crosses and so forth, and it's nice to have a person to talk to when you see something. <laughs> so there there are advantages to to having a person, I think, instead of just just a camera. For one thing, you you've got one person, you know, that's that's up here that's had a chance to learn, especially if you've been up here as long as I have. You can really learn the countryside and the landmarks, you learn the roads, and you can and talk to people that are, you know, the firefighters on the ground that are trying to locate the fire that you reported. And you can get a lot of helpful exchanges that way and help them to, to get into the fire. Whereas um, the camera, I think, I think most of them are monitoring maybe not just one lookout, but maybe several lookouts sometimes. And they've got a bunch of different screens and one person is kind of trying to do all that. And chances are that that person maybe never even visited that lookout, much never staffed it, or the ones they're trying to monitor. So you kind of kind of lose that. And I guess sometimes they can, they can be helpful, but sometimes it's, it's a lot harder for them to, to pinpoint the distance, figure out where, where the fire is. It's Cause they're, you know, don't know the landmarks as well. And you can't, can't really get the depth as well. I don't think on the screen as you can from being up here and knowing the country. And then also when you have visitors coming up, you can provide information to to visitors, you know, fire restrictions, um, all kinds of stuff like that. So that's that's always helpful. And there are actually a lot of people that have a hobby of visiting lookouts. And even when even when I don't have the gate open, people do walk up here and visit. So <laughs> It's not as isolated as you might think. When you're inside, you've got a glass house all the way around and you're so used to being up here, you kind of, I mean, when something is, is different, you notice right away. 
even if you're not not doing one of your specific scans, I mean, you just can tell when something is not right and you start looking at it and spot a smoke that way. And then when you do spot a smoke, um, typically what I, what I do, I'll get, get the fire finder, get an azimuth reading from that first, and then I go to work with the, the landmark, trying to narrow it down. And you know, um, from the firefinder, your lookout is positioned in the center of the map, and you've got a tape running across the middle of the, the map when you get the smoke in your sights. And you know, unless it's really far away, it's somewhere between where your lookout is in the middle of the map, underneath that tape and the edge of the map. So you can kind of narrow it down that way. You know it's on that line and then you know your your peaks and your drainages and and you can kind of gauge things measure say say if i was looking at mount mclaughlin which is invisible right now but it's right there <laughs> it's it's about 10 air miles out there and say well is it on this side of mount mclaughlin or on, on the other side and you just narrow it down and and look at what it lines up with, so where you, you know things that you know exactly where they are on the map. Then you can narrow it down and go by the topography, you know, if it's in a drainage or on top of a ridge. A lot of time you're looking at something that's maybe on the other side of the ridge. And depending on, on how far out it is, if you're looking a really long ways, Say if I was was looking at something maybe over the ridges towards towards Shady Cove or something, and it's it's way out there, but the column is coming up from behind the ridges, and I can't see all those ridges there that are in there. In that case, I would usually just give an azimuth reading and you know check with the dispatch to see if they've already got something figured out in that area or whatever because I can't really I don't have maps that far and I can't see <laughs> you know a lot of times it will tend to look a lot closer than it is when it's on the other side of the ridge for instance the the bootleg fire was just to the east of us over here and that was maybe actually 40 50 air miles from me but it looked like, you know, when it was putting up some of those big columns, it looked like it's right over the ridge. <laughs> of course, you know, when you've been up here a while and, and you see stuff like that, you know better and don't get freaked out by it. But it could be easy for someone that doesn't have the experience if you're trying to look at a smoke and it's way out there on the other side of a ridge. And then you go to try to... Um, give a location you're probably going to be off because you really can't can't see how far out behind that ridge it is so mainly i'm concerned with the area in our our um, high cascades district and depending on whether some of the other lookouts are staffed or not how far i will try to get but and it also depends visibility can vary vary a lot how well the visibility is. I mean, some days it's super clear and I could see see things all the way up on the Rogumqua Divide and well enough to, you know, actually plot out a legal, you know, the township range and section and try to get it down to the quarter section as close as you can or, or less than that if you can, can see that well. Or if you can see, you know, any identifying thing, like a little bit of road or something that's close to there that can kind of help them to to narrow it down or figure out how best to, to get in there, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Well, I don't, I don't know how long forever lasts, but I hope for, for quite a while longer there will be. I mean, I think there should be. I think, um, you know, having, having a staffed person on a lookout is actually actually one of the more e economical and efficient ways of of doing that as there are things i mean like your aircraft for instance 
And they have to fly over, and if the smoke doesn't happen to be showing up at that exact second that they're flying over, they're not going to see it. And we get a lot of, uh, especially after lightning storms, we'll get a, a lot of fires. There, and there might be in a old dead log or stump or snag or something, and they're just kind of puffing up, you know, every few minutes at first. And an aircraft can, can easily miss something like that. But if you don't have somebody up here watching, then that can smolder for days and people don't know it's there. And all of a sudden you get um, maybe really gusty east winds or something and that thing blows up and next thing you know you've got a great big fire because there wasn't, wasn't anybody up here watching it. So maybe so. more of the minutia you can... Mm -hmm. hone in on that, that, yeah. that would be useful. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and then there's, you know, shortcomings too as far as your, your camera system. You've always got a worry of, of vandalism. People tend to go to these peaks a lot, and if there's no person up there, they tend to get vandalized. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how much those things cost, but I don't think you'd want people <laughs> tearing it up because that would be expensive. Mm -hmm. And they've, they've got blind spots and, and you don't have someone there that you can actually talk to, you know, that maybe can move around or go outside, get a better view or something. So, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of, of ups and downs, but at least, you know, if they could keep a few of them going, and especially if they have more than one to where you get, you know, a couple of them in your busiest areas that can do across and triangulate that's that's really helpful yeah. and I'd, I'd like to see more of them come back because what happens when you don't when you don't get the big fires and they forget about you know the lookout reports a fire when it's small and it gets put out if that had turned into a big fire and cost millions of dollars <laughs> you know that kind of you know, don't always get credit for that but, and then of course, you know, when the fires do get big and we're stuck with this smoke for a long time, it's not very much fun. Mm -hmm. So. Do you, I mean, is this something that you see yourself doing? I'm, I'm going to hang in for as long as I can. We'll, we'll see how it goes. You know, we've got... Like I said, I just got a new deck built up here, and they're going to do some more work on the stairs and whatnot. So hopefully the the tower will last several more years, and we'll we'll see what lasts longer, the tower or me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to be be able to keep climbing up the stairs, it's it's kind of something I won't be able to do forever and ever. <laughs> it's a bit of a hike. Yeah, yeah. But I just, I just take it slow. So, and hopefully, hopefully I'll be able to stay up here for quite a few more years. Mm -hmm. And we'll see what happens.